Okay, let's pick up from where we stopped. Uh, let me just put the notes on. All right, so let's look at the nature of God's covenant with man. Right? So we've been, we know, we've established the fact that God is a covenant-keeping God. God has the, is the one who is behind the covenant. We've established the fact that we are partakers of his covenant. And so let's look at the nature of God's covenant. Right, uh, Page 8. God is the initiator and the keeper of the covenant. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Right? Abraham didn't make the covenant. The Lord made the covenant with Abraham. Right? Uh, God appeared as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those two pieces talking about when God made the covenant with Abraham. Now, let us consider, you know, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, God speaks to Abraham and he gives a whole uh, description of what he's going to do. He says, I will establish my covenant. The word established means accomplish and f confirm. Now, uh, if you've seen, you know, I'm sure most of us would have seen big colleges and universities, right? Uh, well, after a couple of years, or maybe if the college is doing really well, uh, and if it's, you know, uh, maybe 10 years or 15 years down the line, it becomes an establishment, right? Which means it is it is established. And nobody can come and say, hey, uh, remove this college from here. Nobody can come and say, this college, this place is mine or this belongs to the government or this, they, they, nothing, nobody can come and disrupt the work because it's an establishment, it is settled, it is confirmed, right? Uh, and so God is telling Abraham, I will establish, which means to uh, confirm, to stand firm, to decree, to endure, to uphold the covenant that I'm going to make with you. I will establish it. Nobody can come and say you're not part of this covenant. Nobody can come and say, you know, uh, you're not well educated. You're not, uh, you know, you're not tall enough. You're not uh, uh, qualified enough. Nobody can say anything because God is telling Abraham, I will establish the covenant. I will confirm it. If anybody has a problem, they will have to deal with me. Right? It's like God is saying, Abraham, I'm choosing you. I will establish the covenant with you. If anybody else says anything and says that you know you can't, you know you you can't be part of the covenant, I will confirm it to them. I will stand firm for you. I will uphold this covenant that I'm making for you. Now the interesting thing is, who was Abraham? He was an idol maker. He. You know, he was he was a Gentile, but God just chose him and said, I'm, I'm going to establish this covenant with you. Genesis 17, 2, he says, I will make my covenant between me and you. The word make is to to initiate. I will I will make it. I will make it come to pass. Exodus 6, 5. I have remembered my covenant. Powerful. God is talking to uh, Moses, uh, or he's, he's, he's telling the people of Israel, I have remembered my covenant. And I gave my covenant to Abraham, and now you're in bondage for so many years in Egypt. It looks like I've deserted you. It looks like I've forgotten you. But hey, Israel, I have remembered my covenant. I will always remember it. I've not forgotten to remember it, but I'm remembering my covenant. Right? He's telling the people of Israel, I've remembered my covenant. Leviticus 26, 44, I will not break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord, their God. It looked like God had broken the covenant. It looked like God had 
abandon the people of Israel. But in a powerful display of miracles, God brings the people out of Egypt. And he says, I will not break my covenant with them. I have promised to Abraham that I will make him, a, uh, that his descendants, I will give them an inheritance. I will bless them. And I am here to fulfill that promise. So what, what if God, what if, you know, Pharaoh and all these people, you know, did all they can to stop Israel? Remember, they were fighting against God because what does God say? I will establish it. I will make it come to pass. I will not break it. Deuteronomy 4.13. So he declared to you his covenant. God declared to you and me the covenant. God has declared it. Now when we open the scriptures, when we open the Bible and we read it, yes, it is people God has used to write the material, but it is God's word. It is God's covenant written through people. He has declared it for us. In Deuteronomy 4.31, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. And so when we read all these scriptures, we can understand that the initiative of the covenant is taken by God. And the fulfillment of the covenant, he puts it into place. He is absolutely committed to the covenant. He's, covenant, he, he's committed to it. Right? And so even when we, we as believers in the new covenant, remember the same rules or the same policy, the same aspects apply. How? We may feel God, you know, uh, maybe we are being tempted every now and then. We fall into temptation. We fall into sin. And we feel discouraged. But remember that you and I are part of God's covenant. So we can always go back to God and say, God, in the, by your blood, you said, that my sins are forgiven. You have washed my, my sins away. And this is your covenant that you have given to us. So you and I can stand and say, God, help me to receive the blessings of your covenant. Help me to walk in obedience, to walk in love. Now the wrong thing to do would be to say, you know, God has never helped me or I see I'm, I'm at a dead end. And so many times now, especially now in these seasons, we're seeing many people abandoning the faith because few of their prayers are not answered. Remember Abraham? God told Abraham, I'll make you the father of many nations. He didn't become, when he was 75, Abraham didn't say, okay, it's five years, let's close this whole thing let's let's go back to doing what uh doing the things that we were doing no he said no 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 god is a god who keeps his covenant he had faith he had faith till the end even though his body was wearing away he had faith till the end right and so even in our lives remember uh, uh partakers as partakers of the new covenant god is the initiator of the covenant I love that verse which says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it was not like God was waiting for us. Okay, let the let people become better. Let them, you know, uh, turn away from their sins. And then I'll come into this world now. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the initiative is from God. Whether it's the old covenant, whether it's a new covenant, the initiation is from God. Now, God has initiated it to man enters into God's covenant. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 12. Yes, one of us, please read that. Deuteronomy 29 and 12.
it's on the notes. Uh, we can just probably read that. What's on the notes? Um, Deuteronomy 29 verse 12, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and on to his oath, which the Lord your God makes you makes with you today. Amen. That you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God. Right? Now, here's the thing. God is giving you the choice. God is giving me the choice. It's a choice. God is not enforcing it upon us. He's saying that you may enter the covenant. And in Deuteronomy, the people probably heard about Abraham. They knew about Abraham. They knew about the covenant. Uh, but they were not yet ready to enter the covenant. They were not yet willing to say, okay, I'm part of the Abrahamic covenant or I'm part of what God, God did through Abraham. You know, maybe they were not willing to enter yet. But the word here says, we may enter into the covenant. It is our responsibility, right? Uh, some translation says, join ourselves. The Hebrew word is lava, which means to twine, to unite, to hold tight, to cleave to the covenant, right? So God offers us his covenant and we make the choice to enter into God's covenant. When we do so, we are joining ourselves with the Lord himself. Right? Remember when we partake in the Lord's table, we'll talk about different covenants as well uh, as the class goes on. But remember uh, the Lord's table, when we partake in the Lord's table, we are partaking in his death, his burial and his resurrection. We are partaking in him. Why is it so powerful? The Lord Jesus died 2000 odd years ago. He did this, you know, he took the bread. It was just a regular meal. But we, we, when, we, when we do it with an understanding that we are part of this new covenant, what God has initiated, we are entering into that covenant. When we do it with that understanding, his power, his resurrection, his life flows in and through us. Why? Because we are partaking in his covenant that he has given us. We enter in and we, we are joined together with the almighty God in the everlasting covenant. We are joined together. Now picture this. We are far away from God, living in sin. And God chooses to draw us back to him. We enter, he gives us a covenant. We enter into that covenant. And we are with him eternally. Even when we look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the things to come, eschatology and uh, the end times, we are going to be with him. What a beautiful covenant. Third one, as every covenant, there are blessings, there are curses. Right? Once we are in covenant with God, we are, we are obeying his covenant word we are obeying his precepts obedient to his instructions and we love him with all our heart mind and soul we are part of his covenant blessings let's read exodus 19 and verse 5 exodus 19 and 5 yes now therefore if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Amen. Thank you, John. If you indeed will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me. So God is saying, when you obey this covenant, you will be blessed. Deuteronomy 28, uh, which we most often read, uh, uh, you know, pronounces blessings and curses of the covenant. When you follow the covenant, I will bless you. I will keep you. I will, uh, I will increase you. Uh, you will be the head and not the tail. You will give. You will not borrow. Uh, people, your light will shine over people. And Deuteronomy 28 talks about this wonderful. Uh, blessings you shall be your children shall be like olive shoots your 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 basket shall overflow all these wonderful blessings but then by violating god's instruction 
there will be curses. Now, what, why, why, why will they be curses? Because we are forfeiting ourselves from the covenant and we're saying, God, I don't want anything to do with you. And the enemy comes in and begins to work his work. And then what does he do? The enemy only comes to bring curses into our lives. And so it is our choice and we are in the uh, in the covenant. We 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 receive the blessings. We enjoy the covenants, even as we uh, obey Him. But if we choose to go away from the covenant, God is not going to you know hold us there or forcefully make us stay in the covenant. He's going to let us go. But by doing so, we have turned away from the God, the Creator of the heaven and the earth. And we are calling upon uh, curses upon our lives, right? Now, one of the questions that some sometimes people ask is, you know, people who are Christians, they they become atheists or they, you know, they they don't believe in God anymore. Their lives seem all right. They have a wife. They have children. They're probably living better lives than us who believe in the Lord Jesus. They have everything. They have a good house, a good car, a good job, everything that they desire, good health. Everything's all right. So so what's the difference? I mean, I'm in the covenant. He's not in the covenant. But he was in the covenant. He's not in the covenant now. And everything is all right with him. But for me, maybe everything's all right. Maybe everything is not yet. You know, I, I, I don't have the blessings that he has. Now, remember that when God establishes a covenant, it's an eternal covenant, right? It's not only to do with material blessings. It's not only to do with the things uh, in this world, right? When in the new covenant, we are, you know, uh, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. We are his, his children and we will continue to be his children even after death, right? in the sense that we will be with the Lord Jesus. We will be with God. We have, uh, our, our sins are forgiven. We have eternal life. So it's not only about you know, the blessings of you know, re receiving healing and deliverance. All that is important, but it's also an eternal reward. I love what Paul says. Paul writes to Timothy, He's writing to him and he's saying, right, listen, Timothy, I've I've done everything I could for the ministry. I've done, I've given my body, I've beaten my body, uh, I've been shipwrecked, I've been uh, gone without food, I've been three days on the sea, I've been beaten by rods, and uh, I've been in prison many times, I've, I've stayed without food. I've gone through all of these troubles. Was Paul part of the covenant? Of course he was part of the covenant. But he was going through all of this. But what does he say to Timothy? He says, I'm not fighting for a crown that will rust in a couple of years. He says, I'm, I, I'm fighting this race because there's an eternal crown waiting for me in heaven. And that is the bigger reward of being in covenant with God. Right? So don't compare you know, sometimes we may think, okay, why is it that they have everything? I, being in the covenant, I don't have it, uh, what they have. Don't compare your life to their life. Yes, we pray, we seek God, uh, but the bigger picture is you and I have an eternal reward uh, to be with the Lord Jesus, right? Fourth one, God does not permit dual commitments. Exodus 34, 14, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Right? God is loyal. He is faithful. And so he expects us to also be faithful. Right? We can't sit on the fence and say, you know, uh, uh, Saturday, Sunday, I will go to the holy side. And Monday to Friday, I'll jump on the unholy side because I'll be in office. We can't do that, right? What well, if we do that? We are, you know, having dual commitments. And God is a God who's, you know, 
very particular about his covenant. He's a jealous God. How can how can we you know please the enemy and also please God? So it's very important that we choose one. Right? I love in the book of Joshua twenty four fifteen. Joshua says it so wonderfully. We we have it on our doorposts. Choose this day whom you are going to serve. And, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was a choice because they were going into the promised land. They've entered, almost entered the promised land. Joshua is telling the people of Israel, now listen, I've been with Moses. I've seen all the things that you people did. I've, then I've, we, we, we brought you into the promised land. We went through many difficulties, challenges. God was there with us. Now, there are the Amalekites. You choose this day whom you are going to serve. I'm not going to choose it for you. He tells the people of Israel, you choose it. You have seen God's wonderful hand. You have seen God's miraculous hand. He has promised to Abraham, I will bring you into your own land, a land that you will have flowing with milk and honey. I've, we've brought you into this land. Now you choose this day whom you are going to serve. You want to serve the gods of uh, the Amalekites, the god of uh, Egypt and uh, the god of the Moabites? Go ahead. But here's the thing, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God does not permit dual commitments. You can't have two covenants, one with the enemy and one with uh, God. Here's the thing, sometimes we hear of people who are probably believers and they abandon everything. They say there's no God. How do they do that? Because somewhere along the line, they have climbed up the fence and sat on the fence and said, okay, I can be here, I can be there also, no problem. I can do this and that, no problem. And somehow the enemy has overpowered them. And they've fallen into the wrong side of the commitment to, into the enemy's hand. Failure to maintain that relationship with God. Failure to maintain and obey blood covenants. Jeremiah 34 has this description. He talks about how, what happens when we don't obey the covenant that God has given us. Right? So four important points there. Uh, let's look at it. The nature of God's covenant. One. God is the initiator of the covenant. He keeps the covenant. Two is man enters the covenant. We enter into it. It's our choice. And when we enter into it, there are blessings, there are curses. And four, God does not permit dual commitments. He is a jealous God. Right. Any questions, any thoughts before we go into five important covenants? Any questions? Shall we go ahead? Yes, uh, everyone okay? Is it uh, able to track along? Yes, Pastor. All right. All right. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, let's go into five important covenants. Now, there are plenty of covenants that God has made in the Old Testament, uh, but let's just look at five um covenants, both in the New Old and the New Testament, uh, and look at the nature, the aspects of that covenant. First one is the covenant with Noah, right? Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you, right? Now, we know what happened here. Uh, God sends a, a flood, destroys the whole earth. Uh, the, everything is destroyed. And let's read Genesis 9. Just read a few verses, not the entire scripture. Uh, verse 12 onwards. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you 
for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be as for you for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature, all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, God has taken this extreme step of, you know, destroying everyone on the face of the earth. He tells Noah, Make an ark. Take your wife, take your children, the children's wife. And we know the story. The flood comes in and destroys everything. And God ends that whole, you know, conversation. And he says, this is a sign. I will put a rainbow in the cloud. And whenever that rainbow comes, I will remember the covenant that I have made with you. I will remember that covenant, right? The covenant that I will never destroy all flesh. So here we see that God has made a covenant here with Noah. So when we see a rainbow, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? Mercy. Mercy. God's mercy upon, uh, you know, uh, the family of Noah. It's a covenant sign. You know, uh, uh, the the rainbow uh, right now you know many people use the rainbow as different uh, you know different they have different interpretations of it but as believers the first thing that comes to our mind must be God you made a covenant with Noah that you will never destroy does that covenant still stand yes yes promised he will never destroy it yet you know, when we read in the old, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus is seated. Revelations, I think it's Revelations five. Uh, the Lord Jesus is seated on His throne, and there are twenty four elders. The angels are all singing, and there's a rainbow over Him. The rainbow is a sign of mercy. Right now, the Lord Jesus. You'll learn in eschatology as well, the end times. Uh, right now, the Lord Jesus is seated on His throne of mercy. But there'll come a time in the old, uh, uh, in the great white throne judgment, the 24 elders are gone. There's no rainbow. There's no mercy at that time. Right now, the Lord Jesus is seated on his throne of mercy. Maybe, you know, you can picture this. This is the covenant, this rainbow. It's a covenant I made with Noah. So, it was a covenant of mercy. Second one. The covenant with Abraham. We all know this covenant. Genesis 15 and verse 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Right, And then in Genesis 17, 1 to 14, um, you know, God tells Abraham about the covenant, right, uh, that which we just read. Uh, uh, my covenant will be with you. No longer your name shall be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. You'll be the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you the nations. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come before you. I will establish my covenant. Uh, and you and your descendants will be greater. You, I will take you to a, a land. And in that land, will be uh, uh, you know a blessed land because you will be in that land. And then God tells Abraham about circumcision. He said, verse 11 onwards, he says, sorry, verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your descendants. After you, every male child among you shall be circumcised. 
and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or, bo or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Right. So now God is telling Abraham, Abraham, I've made a covenant with you that you will be the father of many nations. You'll be blessed. I will exceedingly bless the land that you're living in. Now, what is the sign that you are partaking of this covenant? There should be a sign. Now, for Noah, there was a sign. There was a rainbow. So, Abraham, what is the sign? I don't want to just give my words, even though God could have said, you know, my word is settled. Uh, but God wanted to give a sign. He said, okay, those who are circumcised, male, male, the reason it's male is so that, you know, the male being the head of the family, it just continues on with the entire family. So every male from eight days old, you'll be circumcised. You are partaking of the covenant that I'm giving you, partaking of the Abrahamic covenant. Even so, up to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, People were getting circumcised. Now, here's the disadvantage. Here's the problem that happened. Remember, John the Baptist came and he says, you know, God can raise up Abrahams from these stones. You know what the people of Israel did? They thought they just have to do the sign, follow the sign, and the other things will be all right. So they said, I need to get circumcised. And if I get circumcised, I'm part of God's kingdom. Yet, they forgot the part where Abraham was obedient to God. They waited. Abraham was faithful. So when, it, when the time came up to the Lord Jesus' time, 400 years of silence, it became a ritual. So remember, dual commitments. The people of Israel were living in sin. They were circumcised, but they were living in sin. So what has God to do now? They are circumcised. They're saying, okay, we are part of Abraham's blessings. We are part of Abraham. Abraham is our forefather. He told us to get um, you know, circumcised. We are circumcised now. And after circumcision, they're living the most horrendous lives, completely in sin. Now God is saying, that's not the point of the covenant. The point of the covenant, the point of being circumcised is to have a relationship with me. Is to understand that this relationship that I made with Abraham is also a relationship that I want to follow, that I expect you to obey. But they had lost the point. That is why the Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, he says, you Galatians, you, you were running the race well. Now, all of a sudden, you've gone into circumcision because they, in the old, the, the people before the Lord Jesus Christ died, they were doing the same thing. They were getting circumcised, but they were living in sin. And so Paul was very upset. Yet, here in this portion, God is telling uh, Abraham, when you circumcise the people, make tell them, that they are part of the covenant. But again, just because they are part of the covenant does not mean everything just comes in just like that. We are to obey that covenant. What about the third covenant? Covenant with Moses and Israel. Exodus 34, 27 and 28. Yes, could one of us please read this? Exodus 34, 27 and 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. 
so he was there with the lord 40 days and 40 nights he neither ate bread nor drank water and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant the 10 commandments amen, amen. Deuteronomy 4:13 thank you uh, Roslyn Deuteronomy 4:13 so he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform the 10 commandments and he wrote them on two tablets now this is one of the most uh you know amazing encounter that Moses had where he comes down he goes up that mountain 40 days without any food without any water he's there in the presence of God and god tells moses moses i have made a covenant with abraham that i will bless this nation probably god is you know explaining the whole thing to moses we don't know what happened on that mountain but he was in the presence of god and god may have written down this law and he said even though these people are in covenant they have lost their way of understanding the covenant of following the covenant of being obedient to the covenant so moses what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you 10 commandments these commandments ask the people to follow it yeah right? and and so moses comes down with those commandments and all and then we see that the people of israel you know when moses was coming down that mountain they said please cover your face moses for the glory of god shines upon you it was a covenant it was an old covenant how much more is the new covenant god made a covenant with moses and israel and the lord jesus when he came he says i've not come to abolish the covenant but i've come to fulfill the covenant you sum up all those 10 commandments and all those laws and commandments in the old covenant the lord jesus says i'll sum it up into one thing love the lord your god love the lord your god love your neighbor as yourself that's it you'll once you do this one thing you will you would have accomplished all of those laws but god made this covenant with moses and israel fourth covenant the covenant that god made with david let's read second chronicles 13 and verse 5 yes one of us please read Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and his sons by a covenant of salt. Yeah, uh, let's read even second chronicles 21:7. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Right. Thank you, John. So both these scriptures uh, talk about prefiguring in the sense that it talks about now at the current time when uh, during that time when uh, David was there, and it also talks about the future. Right. So should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave dominion over Israel to David forever? Now it's talking about King David. and also talking about Jesus Christ the seed of David right so that's it's prefiguring prefiguring it's called it's for both right uh Isaiah 11:10 uh says and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious here God is making a covenant with David and he's saying David you may be a little shepherd boy you may be uh you know just a quiet person the most inferior among all your brothers you may be a nobody in your own eyes but here's what I'm going to do I'm going to make a covenant with you that out of the root of Jesse out of your father out of Uh, out of you out of your descendants shall come the son of the living god and the gentiles shall call upon him shall seek him isaiah 55:3 incline your ear and come to me hear and your soul shall live 
and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Jeremiah 33, 21. Then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. So God is saying to David, David, right now you're the king of Israel. There'll come a time when the true king will come from your descendant. And this covenant I am making with you. It's going to be from your seed, from your uh, generation, he is going to come. So what a wonderful testimony. Maybe at that time, David may have thought, what, what's happening here? I'm the king of Israel. Which other king is going to come? Maybe he thought of that. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he understood it. Right? Maybe he understood that God is talking about the future and he writes in the Psalms uh, uh, in many places he writes oh, my soul longs to see the coming of the king and so yes there were, he, God has made a covenant with David and he established that covenant uh, and we see that also through the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ right the fifth covenant covenant with a new creation that is with the Lord Jesus Christ Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. Can one of us please read this entire portion? Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 16. Therefore, remember that once uh, you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been, bought, have, been, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Amen. Thank you, John. What a wonderful final co covenant the Lord God did for each one of us. We saw the Abrahamic covenant, we saw the Noah, Noah, Noah covenant. We saw the Davidic covenant. And we saw the covenant God made with Moses. The final covenant, a covenant that is written in each of our hearts. We were once far away from Christ. What does the scripture say here? Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made both one has broken the middle wall of separation remember that in the old covenant the people would the high priest what would they do the people of Israel also they would bring their offerings they would cut a lamb they would shed the blood what does that blood do the blood would cover the sins it's like the high priest will pray and say, Oh God, cover his sins. Don't look at this person's sins. Or don't look at my sins. Let this blood cover that sins. It is a physical representation of what the Lord Jesus did. Where when he gave his life, he shed his blood. This time, it was not a covering of sins. It was forgiveness of sins. This time, the blood that was shed was not the blood of rams and goats and calf, but the blood of the sinless one, the Son of God. And this new covenant, what happened? It's an everlasting covenant. So nobody can break this covenant. Whether we, when we are partakers of it, whether we follow it, if we don't follow it, Obviously, we're going to be uh, uh, turned away. But if we follow it, 
this is an everlasting covenant. We were once far away from Christ, but Christ drew us near together by his eternal sacrifice. What does verse six, 15 say? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity and the law of the commandments, so as to create himself the one new man from the two, that's making peace. Having abolished the flesh, meaning now we don't have to go and get circumcised. We don't have to, you know, uh, you know, in the uh, Noah, Noah's covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, it was circumcision was like a sign. In Noah, Noah's covenant, uh, the rainbow was the sign. For Moses, the sign was, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments, the covenant. But in this covenant, it's a new heart, a new man. It is not a physical, you know, something that we can do, but it's something that we become in ourselves. Right? It, 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 once we become a believer, there's no sign, there's no physical sign. You know, you, we may have the baptism certificate and all, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any wasn't, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new man. A new covenant that is written in each of our hearts. And so, what a wonderful testimony you and I have. You know, we're not partakers. We're not like in the old covenant, you know, waiting for sins to be washed away or doing all these sacrifices, getting circumcised. Not required. What God has done is he's made that covenant more than physical representations, he's made it a covenant that is eternal, that is spiritual, that changes our inner man itself. And so it's such a joy, you know, when we are partakers of this covenant, we follow, we, we accomplish or we fulfill all the covenants in the old as we are partaking in this new covenant. So uh, with this, we'll come to a close on chapter one. Um, I just want to encourage you to, if you find time, uh, do take some time, just read it. You know, there's a lot of material there. Uh, uh, but I want to encourage you to walk out of this identity uh, that we are walking in this new covenant with Christ Jesus. Right? We're no longer slaves, no longer in bondage, but we're set free by the blood of Christ. Let's close in prayer. Uh, maybe one of us can... Uh, close in prayer, uh, Jafina or Silatoli, any one of you can please close in prayer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Wonderful God, we thank you, Lord, for this powerful eye-opening session that we had. Father God, as we studied on understanding your covenant with us, Lord, I pray, as we dig deep into these teachings, may we be obedient like Abraham, and thereby receive the blessings that you have instilled for us. I pray, Lord, that I pray and I pray and commit each and every one of us into your mighty hands. Help us, Holy Spirit, as we meditate on what we learned in this session. Help us to not only be hearers, but doers of the word of God, bringing glory to your name and fulfilling your call upon our lives. I also thank you, God, and bless our dear pastor, Anoint him in a very special way. Use him for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thank week you. ahead. Uh, see you next week. God bless. God bless.